and tell us who you are, where in the world you are. Are you a social worker? Are you a student? Um, let's have a chat before the webinar starts. So hopefully you've missed us. Um, we've really, really missed you. When Siobhan said that we were going to have a break, I was like, oh, yes. But then I didn't know what to do with myself. So really, really pleased that we're back. So let's have a look. Everybody is in the chat. And we've got, oh, welcome back, guys. Happy 2021. Yeah, it's 2021, isn't it? How many people have written the date wrong? I haven't done it wrong yet, so I'm really pleased with myself. Uh, Becky's put her hand on, you've done it wrong. Um, <laughs> so where are you from then? Where in the world? And are you a student social worker? Are you a social worker, a practice educator? Let's have a look. We have... Uh, Michelle, Emily. it's about time for us to get started, though, Callie. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're, we're at five past eight, so definitely... Yeah, I've, I've, you've made me hungry and I now want to get on with the webinar. So thanks for that, guys. OK, um, so as Kelly said, we've got lots of new members of the team joining us tonight. We've also got a special guest. You'll get to meet them as the session goes on and unfolds. Um, as usual, what we're going to ask you to do, if you have any technical issues, please put them into the Q&A. Uh, where Kat and Chris and Kelly will um, deal with those. Um, in the chat, all the other team members at the moment, because we're going to change roles around a little bit, but all the other team members are going to join you in the chat and say hello. If you've been watching our social media recently, we've introduced them all to you, so you'll get to meet people um, season two. So uh, we're looking forward to introducing mm. you to our new members later tonight. But we're going to, uh, quite a few people in the chat said you're here for the first time and that's great uh, you are very welcome lots of people we know are coming back lots of people have attended every webinar we've had so far and we are up to number 27 tonight so we're going to go uh, straight into tonight's content which uh, at the time seemed like a really good idea if I'm honest last at the end of last year I was so busy and the team was saying what are we going to do for the first one back we need a back to the uh, we need a back to basics one what are you going to call it and I said well we're going to introduce the new team members and so let's just call it back to the future at the time seemed like a really good idea but actually if I'm going to be entirely honest with you I have never watched the back to the future movie and I hadn't even thought of it as the movie the team got themselves really excited that I was going to do something about the movie and that wasn't the plan at all because I'd never even seen the movie so over Christmas, I ended up having to sit down and watch the movie, which is what I did. And this is what I discovered. So if you have never watched the Back to the Future movie, this is what I discovered. It's a 1985 American science fiction film, which focuses on going back 30 years in time. And I thought when I sat there and I watched it that night over Christmas, you can even see the Christmas cards on the photo there because I was watching it in the middle of Christmas then I thought that was really spooky because my applications to become a social worker all happened in 1985 that's when I applied for social work training and I've actually been qualified for 30 years so it felt a little bit kind of that those two had come together so I thought okay this is all about time travel when I watched it and what can I do with a webinar around social work based on Back to the Future. So we're going to do lots of different things tonight. We're going to do a bit of time traveling. We're going to do a bit of where are we here and now. It will tie in with Back to the Future, but there's something for everyone in tonight's Back to Our webinars session. I think time travel questions are always really helpful in social work. So, for example, as a practice educator, I often will ask students in supervision, if you could go back in time, what would you do differently and why would you do it differently? I'll also sometimes ask students, if you could go forward in time, say if you could go forward 20 years, what would you want the child that you're working with now to remember about social work involvement in their lives? 
And those questions can be really helpful for you to reflect and add into a reflective assignment. For example, looking at a piece of what would you want this person to remember? If it's a child, you can go a long way into the future. If it's an adult, you might just go a year or two into the future. But what would you want them to remember about your involvement with them? So those questions can be really helpful in social work. So tonight we're going to do some time travel. We're going to look back. We're going to look forward. But we're, always, we're also going to pause in the present as well. So I'm going to take you back to um, these two books, which I, these are really old books now. I spent hours studying these books to prepare for my social work interviews in 1985 and I'm going to suggest to you that actually it's a really good idea sometimes to go back to books I see and I think it's one of the tips that we've given in a previous webinar I see so many people who qualify as a social worker and sell their books I just think don't do it because I love going back to the books that I used all you know all those years ago and think about how far social work has come. So I'm going to take you back to a book that was um, not written in 85. I didn't use it to prepare, if I'm honest. These were, I used these to prepare in 1985 for my training. But this one is um, Hugh England. So this was in 1986. And it's a quote taken from page two of this book, Social Work as Art written in 1986 remember and Hugh England said if I imagine social work as an entity I see it as a curiously puzzled and confused body there are parts rushing off in all directions and sometimes falling over each other in the process they're rushing to be busy and to be engaged for to be busy and engaged is to feel assured that something worthwhile and important is being done. And social workers deal with problems that cannot humanely be neglected. But busy doing what? For to be busy is also often to be too busy to think. And I think that's really important. Mm. As social workers, we are incredibly busy. But it's vital that we don't end up being too busy to think too busy to think about what's happening. That's really important. We need to take time to reflect. So we're going to reflect a little bit on why we started these webinars, what they're all about and what we want to do with them in the future. Back in time to when we started these webinars, we started the webinars because I was seeing all over social media I was really concerned because students were talking about having their placements suspended or having their placements cancelled. And there was a lot of uncertainty about the impact of the pandemic on social work learning, on practice education, which is where I work, as well as on social work practice. So we're talking about the first lockdown in England and the impact and all of that. And I then reached out and said, does anyone want to help put some webinars together? And that's where these webinars came from. But we took a little break, only a couple of weeks over Christmas, and we've gone into another lockdown in England. I know Scotland and Wales were in it earlier and Northern Ireland too, but we've got this further lockdown and it's almost like a situation of deja vu. It feels just like it did when we set up the webinars as we restart and go and look towards a new season of webinars. It feels just like a situation of deja vu as though it was all happening before as well. And a couple of pictures that I'm just gonna show you here on screen show us what contemporary social work is all about. These photographs are from a student social worker on placement. Would you have thought that 18 months ago, even 12 months ago, a student induction pack would involve a packet of masks, a packet of gloves, some alcohol gel, a phone and a laptop? And that sitting in a social work office for days at a time looking out at a completely empty environment. 
And yet for many social workers, well, for many social work students, placements have either been cancelled or postponed or suspended, or even if people are in placement, it can feel a bit like that. And so we really want to make sure that these webinars offer you somewhere that you can come together and share with other people how it feels. But we also want the webinars to be a place for learning, a place for looking to the future of social work and many other. Um, I think people get lots of other things out of it. People learn about what everybody's having for the tea, even sometimes gives you some ideas what you want to have for your tea the next night. But there's lots of things that we hope the webinars will provide. When we go back and we look back to why we started the webinars and what we did in the early stages, one of the topics that we covered that I think is really worth going back to and expanding on because we now know more about it is the concept of moral injury. And so I want to just talk for a little while tonight about moral injury. And as I talk about this, I want you to think about yourselves. I want you to think about if this is impacting on you, if it's impacting on your colleagues. I want us to just have a space for us to talk about moral injury. As a concept, this is taken from the military. It was actually developed more than 20 years ago by Jonathan Shea, who was working with um, veterans of the Vietnam War. And moral injury is a concept used in the military to refer to the psychological distress that results from taking actions or perhaps from not being able to take actions that violate your moral I think we would say ethical code. In the military, they talk about a moral code, which is why it's called moral injury. When we first started to talk about it in um, social work, I wondered whether I should rename it really ethical injury, because would that be more suited to social work? But the phrase moral injury is used very widely outside of social work. And you might have even seen on the news today, a report that's come out exploring moral injury in healthcare workers in the UK. But this is an, a concept that it's important for us to be aware about and to think about. In an article in the British Medical Journal, um, very early last year, before we started the webinars last year, um, by Greenberg et al, um, they highlighted, they were like um, almost like practice educators for healthcare professionals, really. And they highlighted the potential for what they saw as significant moral injury for healthcare professionals during the pandemic. Because of three things, and this is their wording, it's not my wording, they said because healthcare professionals would need to think about how to allocate scant resources to what they described as equally needy patients. Because people would need to balance their own physical and healthcare needs with those of their patients. And because they needed to make decisions about how to align their duty of care towards patients with their duty towards their own family network. And they said, because of those three things, that healthcare professionals were likely to experience significant moral injury. Now we talked about this in webinar three and many of you might remember Kat shared a particular situation where she was working from home and something that happened that created a moral injury for mm -hmm. her. And I want us to just revisit the idea of moral injury and think about whether this is something that might be happening for you? Are you being asked to do something that violates your, our social work ethics? Do you have any concerns about not being able to do something and that violating your ethical framework? And is that leaving you with the potential for moral injury? I'm hearing about aspects of moral injury all of the time. So I'm talking to people, phrases that stand out in my mind is a, a hospice social worker who used a phrase that's really stuck with me, who said, here I am sitting at my kitchen table doing death and dying. So difficult. 
hospital social workers who are saying I'm closing so many cases every day because of the number of people who are dying. COVID-19 is impacting on social work really significantly and I want us to have a space where we can talk about this because it's important. In many ways the idea of moral injury is familiar to us it's sort of similar to things that we know about that we already talk about in social work so concepts like um compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma we're familiar with those things um but we wouldn't expect those to impact on people until they've been around for a while in social work and yet we know that students and newly qualified social workers are experiencing moral injuries at an alarming rate in social work at the moment. People who develop moral injuries are likely to experience negative thoughts about themselves or other people and feelings of shame, guilt or disgust are common. We know that moral injury can impact on practice and morale. We know that it's also going to impact on people's analysis and decision making skills and other core practice skills as well. And I've been doing a bit of research, a bit more research about this over the Christmas break and Places like the Awareness Therapy Centre are doing a lot of work with healthcare professionals at the moment experiencing moral injury. And, and they say that the symptoms of moral injury can manifest in changes in sleep patterns, in significant or persistent changes in behaviour or habits, making mistakes, isolation, compulsive behaviour and a weakened sense of empathy or compassion. This stuff matters and you might be experiencing moral injury at the moment. What we need is the opportunity to talk to one another about it and a safe space to be able to talk to one another about it. There is some good news. There are things that we can do that mitigate the impact of moral injury that can prevent the injury occurring or can mitigate how significant it is. And those things are a sense that you belong to a community of practice and that you work as part of a team. And that might be just that you belong to a community of student social workers or that this webinar group on a Wednesday night offers you a community of practice. A strong reflective culture within the organisation, good quality, emotionally supportive and reflective supervision. The opportunity for an in-depth reflection with a particular focus on feelings and emotions. Education about the potential of moral injury and a permission to talk about it and explore the depth of that injury with colleagues matters. And that's why we're talking about it tonight. The more that we know about it, the more that we talk about it, the more that we can work with and recover from moral injury. And finally, we need to feel that our work is valued and that we are clearly recognised in the work that we do. And very often social workers don't feel valued. We don't feel recognised in the work that we're doing. So it matters. We need to be able to value one another. We need to be able to reflect with one another. We need to be educated about the potential for moral injury. The other good news is that looking to the future and time travel is that long-term consequences of morally injurious events are not inevitable. We know that and the Awareness Therapy Centre says that to us. Now they're working with healthcare professionals and we could change this to think about social care professionals but they say although exact data isn't available it's likely that most healthcare workers who experience morally injurious events will not have long-term negative outcomes. In fact, after potentially morally injurious experience, some people even eventually develop a redefined meaning in life. And with time and support, they can begin to incorporate the experience into growth or into helping others. 
So whatever's happening for you at the moment, however things feel at the moment, however difficult things are, I know Nicola Sturgeon earlier talked about these are dark and difficult times, and they are for all of us. But however it feels, it's not going to be like this forever. And having an opportunity to talk with one another, to think about placement difficulties, to think about difficulties in practice, all of those things matter. As a group, we have a WhatsApp group. We've got a community of practice in the, in the team that bring you these webinars every week. And in the webinar uh, WhatsApp group this weekend, Kelly went out for a walk and she put this photo into the WhatsApp group along with a uh, sentence. The snowman is self-isolating on the bowling green. And she said, it's good to see he's at least wearing a mask. And it made me think about masks. It brought a smile to my face. We all put a couple of smiley laughing faces into the WhatsApp group. But it really made me think about, we're all wearing masks and that's having a significant impact on our social work practice at the moment. But what I want to say, and I want us to recognize here and recognize that here is a safe place for you to talk about it is it's not just PPE masks that we're wearing at the moment. We're wearing other kinds of masks. We're masking our feelings, we're masking our emotions. And at times we need a safe space to be able to talk about that, to be able to take the mask off. We don't have to be there to be positive for people. I hear so many people saying, oh, but you've just got to be positive, haven't you? And actually, if you're feeling under pressure to be positive, it's not gonna help. So this gives you a safe space to talk about the emotions in the chat, to just say, oh, you know, I'm not feeling great or it's not great. Don't feel that you have to put on a mask when we're here. Because what matters is this, the best support that we can offer right now is open and honest conversations. So people feel heard and validated in their experiences. That is what is gonna help us all to get through. Once we're through it, there's gonna be different work for us to do. Whenever I've spoken about moral injury, and this isn't a quote from me, but could just as easily be in a quote from me, but whenever I've spoken about moral injury, there've always been people in the audience who've breathed a huge sigh of relief because there is a name for the way that they're feeling. And it's no different now in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. You are the first generation of social workers that are going to qualify in the midst of a global pandemic or that are going to do your first year in practice in the midst of a global pandemic. We really need to find ways to talk about how we're feeling, both the good and the bad, so that we can bear it. And I've put in bold, this is taken from a blog written by someone who does some work um, with healthcare professionals around moral injury. And what she says is, it's silence that will do the harm, not talking. And that's really important. Silence harms. We know in terms of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, George Floyd's murder and everything we've talked about since, it's white silence that's the danger. Silence kills. Silence is dangerous, talking isn't. Talking about these feelings and emotions really matter. And so that's what we hope these Wednesday webinars will do. They'll give us through the next season an opportunity to talk about what it feels like to be a social worker now, what we hope for social work in the future and drawing on aspects of social work in the past. And that's what we're hoping we're gonna be able to do. And this is a little bit what I learned from watching Back to the Future. In the film, the relationship between Doc and Marty sits right at the core of the film. Relationships are really important. We know that in social work, don't we? We know that relationships, feeling that you belong and a sense that you're part of a community of practice really matter in terms of supporting us through moral injury. And so, 
it made me think a little bit as I was thinking about Marty and his relationship with the doc. It reminded me a bit of the practice educator student relationship where we learn from one another, where we work together, where we experiment, where we test things out. I can't remember what it's called now. I think it's the flux capacitator or something like that that seems to power everything. It's almost like they work together to power everything through and to solve the problems and to, um, and they, that relationship really works. And for me, relationships really matter. And in these webinars, we try and bring along special guests to share their experiences and talk about what they do. And so I'm going to introduce you now to a special guest who is here with us tonight. And um, that's Marie. And uh, you'll have been introduced to Marie on social media. But Marie's going to chat to you a bit tonight about her experiences as a practice educator and what works for her and I suppose looking towards the future of social work lots of different things you're going to be talking about Marie but Marie and I have met quite a few times at different events and came together quite recently um, in some sessions that I've been doing to promote conversations about moral injury and I was really impressed by something that Marie brought to one of those sessions and then asked her if she'd come and share some of her ideas tonight so Marie, I think you're going to share some ideas and some concepts. I don't know if you want me to go straight to your first slide or not, or you want to introduce yourself, Marie. Oh, I think I'll just do a bit of chatting because I've lost your presentation now, Siobhan. And thank you for that. And hello, everyone. Um, like I said, I've lost the pictures. And I feel a little bit like that Doc, doc and Marty. And he actually looked like him a bit, I think, Siobhan. <laughs> 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 so, as, as Siobhan was saying, after speaking to Siobhan over Christmas, I, I decided to put something together because I'm quite a visual practice educator and I find that a lot of students, really, it links in with a lot of students. And if it doesn't, we'll look at, I'll look at supporting them any other way. So, I put something together visual, looking back in time and also in this current climate, reflecting on my own timeline and chronology and work with students I've worked with since I started social work. Thinking about placement, jobs I've been in, you now being an off-site practice educator, as well as working part-time on the adult team. So I love uh, Siobhan's theory cards and, and I promote them to all my students and they'll probably tell you that. In fact, one of my, somebody told me, two of my friends uh, told me to stick the theory cards because I wouldn't shut up about them at one one time. So using the solution focused questions and theory cards from the past, I sat down and decided to reflect on both the past and the present. So one of the pictures what Siobhan is showing, which I can't see at the moment, is our link theory, legislation, PCF, strengths, needs and risks to cases, whilst working with students and mapping the cases out. I think this really helps. So recently, during the training session, I decided to use the Ed Arts and Hands reflective model. Again, putting the reflection card at the centre of a very large piece of paper, which I normally do, linking to social pedagogy and values in social work. This then made me think about a case I was working with, which was a young adult with a learning disability. I decided to pick something a little bit different. So it really helped me to focus on my reflection whilst also using the shared model because I know I go off on a tangent and often need to bring myself back to the future Jerome, and focus. I find that students I support engage very well using the visual approach whilst linking cases to practice, again, legislation, theory and PCS, depending on that person's learning needs. So I recently, I worked with one student out of many I've supported over the years in real life, the shared model, and it worked really well with her because uh, she, she was dyslexic and was not that keen on the case map then. So on reflection, after thinking about the above, my advice to students would be find a model of reflection which really suits the individual's needs by trying a different one, trying different ones first. This will help you, like us as practice educators, and the student reflect in different ways. And also when using the shared model, it's fine to use when you first get your when you first get your case. However, I and students have found it to be more beneficial once a student does have a lot more information and has been working with the case for a few weeks. Another tip is using the shared model or whichever one, such as the weather model or the bake-off, 
before sitting down to write your assignments or your, cap, your critical analysis practice out. And remember, social work is about building relationships, relationship-based practice, empowering service users, using resources, research, models and theories that suit you and your individual learning style. So my advice to any students at this time would be to use research theory and reflective models. They do really help want to reflect and keep things structured. I could go on forever, but that's me for now. Thanks, Marie. I mean, I've Thank just been putting... Um, just been putting up some of the things that you do with students in supervision getting them to think about situations and using like big pieces of paper and lots of mind mapping and I do love the way that you use the reflective prompt cards because that's what you do don't you? you you I mean the one that I'm going back to now the head heart hands and feet model that's what you prepared to bring, bring to a reflective conversation we were having about casework during the pandemic and moral injury wasn't it um yeah. but I, I loved the way when I said to you do you want to come to our back to the future webinar and then you sent me the, the piece of paper with back to the future written on at the top and you even did it in the actual um the text, the font that's used in Back to the Future, didn't you? you got, I could see you got your, your highlighter pens out and you were writing it at the top. But I'll tell you what you pointed out to me, Marie, um, that I hadn't even noticed, even though I wrote the cards and I wasn't thinking, what am I going to do on Back to the Future? And you said one of the solution-focused questions that I ask on that reflective prompt card is, if you could design a machine which could do everything that was needed in this situation, what would it look like and what would it do and that links into the time machine thing didn't um, it and I've yeah. not even thought about that but it actually is a really good question to think about that one isn't it in relation to problem solving and looking for solutions in situations and so I love the way that you work really visually and we were hoping that some of these things that we've just shown on the screen and some of the things that you've talked about Marie would help people in thinking about how they can work. And I think virtual working as well. I mean, I don't think your mind, if I tell people, Marie, you're sitting in your garage at the moment, aren't you? It's been beautifully, yeah. it's been beautifully done up, but you're like working from home with lots of students, but doing everything virtually, but still using these very visual techniques in working with students, which I think is fabulous. Um, so thanks for Siobhan, this one was an example from a student last year. He doesn't mind me sharing it. And it's it's uh, name's been changed on there. And I this stands out for me. I think because it's bright and and the other one, the other it, it just links into everything and he got a lot out of this. It really helped him with his assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, and now he linked it to KSS. Can you see at the top on the left? He linked to the PS PCF and the KSS as well. And he found it a really good way. Normally, my people are sticking stick people, but he's done a bigger person. He must have been yeah. looking at me while they were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that, Marie. Thank you, and thanks for joining us tonight. It's really, it's really good of you. So, thank you for doing that. Thank you. So um, we do like to put people in what we call the spotlight. So that was the practitioner spotlight. Sometimes we have student spotlights and it was a practice educator spotlight tonight. So thank you for joining us, uh, Marie. We're going to be looking at now what you would preserve in time. What would you put into a time capsule at the moment that captured social work in 2020 or 2021? Um, that would be, I suppose, what you might call would be culturally and historically significant. So um, I read when I was doing a bit of a Wikipedia on uh, what, what I could take out of the Back to the Future movies. And I read that in 2007, the uh, US Library of Congress selected Back to the Future for preserving it because they said uh, it was going to go part of their national film registry because they said as a film it was culturally and historically significant. So I'm asking you the question now, what would you preserve? Marie would preserve some of that uh, visual, those big visual posters that she's done on social work and they would go in and they'd look brilliant because people would pull those out in years to come and look at what social work is all about. So, but I was, I'm going to ask you what you would preserve 
and I'm going to tell you what I would preserve now. I'm going to direct you to a couple of things that are freely available resources that I think every social worker should be looking at at the moment, um, particularly in terms of thinking, we've talked about moral injury, we've talked about what could be really helpful, we've talked about the relationship between a practice educator and a student, but let's look at what we would really preserve about what we're doing right now. And firstly, there's, for me, I would say it's important to think about the international definition of what we do. So what's it all about? What is social work all about? The international definition tells us that social work is a practice based profession and an academic discipline. It promotes social change and development, social cohesion and the empowerment and liberation of people. Principles of social justice, human rights, collective responsibility and respect for diversities are central to social work. Underpinned by theories of social work, by social sciences, by humanities and indigenous knowledge, social work engages people and structures to address life challenges and enhance well-being. And that's what social work is all about. So I would want to preserve that as that's the 2014 international definition of social work. But on a personal level, I would also want to include this less well-known definition of social work. Written by Ruth Allen in the Professional Social Work magazine in 2018. Ruth said, Social work is about life, treasuring humanity, building connections, sharing, promoting fairness. It's about creativity, care and love. It's being there to help people overcome obstacles and oppressions that hold them back. For the people using our services, a social worker should be someone to trust and believe in someone who helps you to believe in yourself. Sometimes we must hold boundaries, protect rights, advocate and challenge. We're always in the midst of the messy stuff, finding ways forward. And never before have we been in the midst of such messy stuff as social workers. And for me, this definition has something about everything in social work. It has words that are so important, like love, like creativity, that you don't see in many other definitions of what we do. I'd also encourage you to look at this document, and this I would definitely put into a time capsule of social work in 2020, 2021. It's an International Federation of Social Workers document called To the Top of the Cliff, how social work changed with COVID-19 and it's freely available. We'll send you the link in the follow-up email after the um, webinar. But in that document, it's a very easy read document, freely available to download. I've put the picture there so you'll recognize it on the website very easily. In that document, it's got four sections. It talks about the beginning of the pandemic. It looks at adapting practice to the pandemic and then reinventing social work. And it then looks towards the future and new aspirations for social work. Now, if you take a look at those four sections, it reminds you of Kaplan's theory about the stages of crisis the three stages of crisis that Kaplan talks about are the impact, the beginning, the recoil, and then the adapting and the reimagining what we do. It follows Kaplan's crisis theory. Now, when I saw it, before I even opened it, just looking at the picture and looking at the title, this is what I thought, and it showed you how we should never make assumptions. But I looked at it and I thought, oh yeah, I know. They've called it to the top of the cliff because that's what happened. You know, things got so serious in social work. We got to the top of the cliff, but we didn't quite fall off. I can see why they're calling it to the top of the cliff. And I got it completely wrong. 
That's not why it's called to the top of the cliff. It's actually this. For Social Work Today, the Secretary General of IFSW, Rory Truel, tells us there is an opportunity to move from the recently imposed role of picking up the debris at the bottom of the cliff to its original role of building fences at the top. We should be all about preventing disaster through work supporting communities to support themselves. We need to move much more to preventative rather than reactive work, don't we? And that's what this title is all about. And I think it's a brilliant title and a brilliant way of looking at it. And I'd advise all of you to read it. It doesn't take long, it's an easy read. A lot of international stuff is quite easy read. It's a really easy read and very relatable. And those of you who are students, you know, this is the kind of thing you need to be getting into your assignments, it's exploring our profession. And the other document that I would suggest you take a look at is this one. It's also an international document. It's about uh, ethics. So it links into moral injury, practicing during pandemic conditions, ethical guidance for social workers. And this is the introduction that Sarah Banks gives to that document. And you need to hear this. We all need to hear this. Social workers have been working tirelessly during the COVID-19 pandemic, not just to deliver much needed services, but also to do this as respectfully, compassionately and fairly as possible. Practicing, and I would say also studying during pandemic and crisis conditions is extremely challenging. Unsettling our old priorities and requiring a reassessment of what might be ethically right in new circumstances. At times when social workers are at their most stressed and isolated, and when fast responses are expected, the importance of slow, careful, ethical deliberation is never greater. This guide draws on social workers' accounts of their real life ethical challenges and responses to offer some pointers for social workers to consider. We hope that social workers will find the time to read it, to reflect on the issues raised and to contribute new ideas and recommendations as circumstances and practices evolve. And I would suggest to you, I know we're all really busy, but if you can find the time, this is probably one of the best documents I have ever read in social work. It goes through the ethical dilemmas that social workers all over the world have faced. And as I put this next slide up, this has been gathered from social workers all over the world. And this shows how we all connect together because some of you here are from Burnley. This could have been written for you in Burnley. Some of you are here from Northern Ireland. It could have been written for you about Belfast. It's about every social worker all over the world. These are the dilemmas and the challenges that COVID have presented to us. People without access to technology or the skills to use it, or those who lose contact might be unable to access services. There are threats to our privacy from home-based ICT systems which might not be reliable or secure. We can have difficulties in ensuring privacy and confidentiality when conversations might be overheard by other members of households of either service users or social workers. We can have difficulties in making fair assessments of service users' needs and living conditions without being able to move freely through a house or without being able to see and sense nonverbal gestures. There are difficulties in creating empathy and building trusting relationships, especially with people who are accessing services for the first time. There can be problems in maintaining boundaries between our personal and our professional life because service users might regard the use of ICT as a more informal means of communication, particularly if a social worker is working from home. And if face-to-face -face meetings do occur, the use of face masks and physical distancing might inhibit relationships and can be off-putting or frightening for service users at stressful times in their lives. And I've just pulled those together out of the document as the key challenges all over the world for social workers working through a pandemic. 
But in that document, it suggests what we might be able to do about that. It suggests ethical solutions and it's kept up to date all of the time. It's being up, updated on the website regularly. So if you get a chance, do look at those ethical standards for social work through a pandemic. And I want us to recognise as we moving towards introducing our new team members and looking towards the future of social work and the future webinars that we have together, I want us to recognise this, which is taken back from the top of the cliff document. But Truel and Crompton say, as the pandemic evolves and then ends, there is a real risk that we will return to the status quo to a gap between rich and poor, to a reliance on philanthropy and charity rather than recognising assets within the global community, which are the foundations of change. For many years, the social work profession has advanced a learning model that collaborates across national borders. Now is a crucial time for the world to establish new global ethical foundations centred around solidarity equality and recognising everyone's diverse strengths, rights and responsibilities. Now is the time that we must do that. Remember, this is all about time. And now is the time for us to come together and think about those ethical standards. The final document I'm going to suggest to you is not a social work document. It comes from health. So it actually comes from Scotland and it's the courage to be kind, reflecting on the role of kindness in the healthcare response to COVID-19 by Ben Thurman. But I'd say we could change that. You could, as you read it, you could just change it into social work. It's a fascinating research document, which talks about the importance of kindness in healthcare practice. And a quote taken from that is, it's important to be kind to staff, Otherwise, they won't have the reserves to bring that into their work and interactions. But if you have staff that are being looked after, this will permeate into how they are with patients. We need to be kind. We need to be kind to one another. We need to be kind to ourselves. And it takes courage to be kind to yourself as a social worker, but it matters. And in that document, it talks about the waves of the pandemic and changes to it. And I was captured by a quote from it coming towards the end, which says, as we go into this continued increase of COVID, we still have the kindness in the way we communicate with each other. But it can be eroded when we're under pressure and we just try to switch to command and control. It's a constant balance between emotions, the needs of the service, your resilience, your kindness. And I'm going to invite everybody here today to think about how we can look to the future of social work with kindness. More than anything else, kindness and love matter. And so as, as I'm inviting that, I'm going to invite each of our new team members to introduce themselves to you and over the next few weeks and months you'll begin to get to know the team who will be bringing more content, more exciting topics to you in the next few weeks. So I'm hoping the team are all ready to switch their microphones on and to introduce themselves. I also asked all the team if they could go back in time to share a message that they would say to themselves and so we're going to start off with Kultuma. If you want to switch your mic on Kultuma and introduce yourself. Hello everyone my name's Kultuma. I'm a second year social work student at the University of Bradford. Um, I've come from a background of working with children from birth to 19 years of age in various settings and I do hope to work with children once I qualify as well. Um, something that I would tell a younger me is to never give up and to have belief in yourself. Um, the reason I, would, I wouldn't I would say to study earlier or do something a bit earlier is because I'm a firm believer that if something is meant for you, 
it won't ever leave you and it will find its way to you eventually. Um, which is why my little quote on your screen says never give up because one day you will achieve it and I am living proof of this. I never thought that I would ever be at university, let alone doing a webinar with Siobhan McLean and the rest of the team. So, you know, always persevere and believe in yourself and, you know, don't let anybody put you down and eventually you'll get to where you want to be. Thank you so much, Cool Tuma. And we are so excited to have you join us on the team. And so I know uh, you're going to play a really pivotal role in what we're doing. So thank you for joining us and introducing yourself. Thank and you. it's great to have you on board. Brilliant to be here. Thank you. And then we're going to go to Di, who some of you will recognise from, uh, she presented a model of reflection for us in webinar 20. But Di, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so hi. So yes, I'm, I'm Di and I am on the apprenticeship route, which is a little bit, it's, it's quite a new one. So I'm like in like second year now. And I think what I wanted to share was I've gone back in time just to the start of my studies. And I would sort of say, take every opportunity that you can. Um, initially, when Siobhan sort of reached out for people to join this team, I sort of thought, I've got nothing to offer. I'm not a traditional student. Um, I'm on a different route, you know, very much involved being employed four days and just one day at university. So I just thought, it's not for me. Um, I've got nothing to give to this. And, and it's one of the things I regretted. And then I had the opportunity to sort of be a guest on the, the webinar 20. Um, so I did take it. So kind of like set my game up a little bit, took the opportunities. And when we came to the end of the 26 weeks, I watched all, all 26 webinars. I think I was a little bit disappointed in myself that I'd never taken that opportunity to join the team from the outset and was kind of like wishing that it was something that I had done. And then it was almost like fairy godmother Siobhan got in touch with me over the Christmas um, break and just sort of asked if I wanted to come on the team. So I did. Um, and, and here I am. And I just think we're all we've all come from different routes, um, you know, different routes into sort of social work. We've got different things to bring. We're all different ages. And I think we've all got something that we can give to, you know, to each other to help in, in this time. Um, just to, to social work, to help and to develop things. So I just think it doesn't matter who you are, just take those opportunities, step out of your comfort zone and um, you can do it. And I think, oh yeah, I live in proof of it. I'm here now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for that, Di. And it's a, it's a fabulous message and I'm glad you did take the opportunity. So thank you for thank joining you. us. I'm really glad to have you on board. And then we're going to go to Nicola, who is going to introduce herself to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicola. I'm, uh, I'm based in Kent and I'm doing the Step Up to Social Work, which is an accelerated 14 month program. I'm doing actually my 100 day placement now. Um, I think if I had to go back in time, I would say exactly what I said um, to Siobhan to that to just value how hopeful I am and how much value I put in relationships and just being empathetic it's not weak I think when I was younger I thought I feel too much it just didn't feel realistic to care that much and actually it's helped me through my career it's helped me all the way through and I when when Siobhan contacted me over the Christmas I forced first I thought this is junk mail and then I checked the email address <laughs> And then I thought, actually, I said, to, I, my words to Siobhan were, I'm not a thoroughbred social worker, I don't speak it, but actually I feel it. And I realized that's what it is for me. I feel it and it's not to save, it's not to fix, it's to actually be supportive and use those relationships to develop um, and to walk in line with people. So I think for me, that's really what I would tell myself is to just stay that hopeful. And even it's, it's helping me now. I mean, I'm isolated now, uh, not because I have symptoms, just because I live on my own and I'm not seeing anyone and I'm doing everything virtually. And it's the hope that gets me through every day. It's speaking to service users and checking in on them, but it's also good for me. So um, I think that would be, be it for me. I think live in empathy rather than it just being a buzzword. It's so important 
because people can be so flippant about about empathy. So I, I would just remind myself that you know feeling this much isn't doesn't make make you weak. At whether it was twenty one or fifteen when I trained as a childcare aide, it really was something that has followed me through. And if you're young and you're doing this, then I would say the same. You know, it's okay to feel hopeful. You don't have to be my old age of 46 doing your training. I have had other experiences in terms of working in education and designing a mentoring program, but doing that has helped me to become a better, you know, on my way to being a better social worker. So don't discount your um, experiences or even your personal experiences, because sometimes those, you know, they, they, they come back in the role. So yeah, I think that's, that's it for me. I don't know if I've, have I spoke enough. <laughs> yeah, that's fabulous. Thank you, Nicola. Do you know what that just reminded me of when you were talking then, completely just came to my mind as you were talking about the importance of hope, was yes. that I, I said I've never seen Back to the Future and I had to watch it over Christmas, but one of my favourite all-time movies is Shawshank Redemption. And right. the quote that goes with that is, fear can hold you prisoner, right. but hope can set you free. And that's really true, isn't it? That right. hope can set us free. Right. And it's so important at the moment. Absolutely. And that's why my favourite quote is, there's power in seeing potential in others. And every time I walk into a room or walk into you know, a home or I'm dealing with someone, I really want to keep thinking what is what's your potential and I think keeping that in mind especially at this time is invaluable. Absolutely and uh, as you know we're really excited to have you on board so thank you so much Nicola thank you and then um, we're going to go to David who is going to introduce himself. Hi guys <clears throat> I'm David I'm studying at Caledonian University in Glasgow uh, second year um, my little quote that says, push on through school, qualify younger and see more of the world, that seems awfully demanding. But the reason being that <clears throat> I, when I was younger, I was literally my own worst enemy and I didn't think I was worthy of anyone's help. So when I struggled at school, I just assumed I wasn't able to pass. I was totally able to pass as we are all able to pass. But there was a, a lesson I would give my younger self is that uh, you are absolutely worthy of people's help and people's attention. Um, you are not a burden and you should push even through the pain and through the struggle and ask for help, I think is the biggest thing. Because had I asked for help, I would have been a social worker at least five years ago now. Um, but now I'm in second year and pushing and asking for help, even though we're all human, that's a struggle at times. And I think um, someone in the chat said age is just a number. I think regardless of your age, you always need help and you always need a bit of support and it is not embarrassing to ask for. Um, so yeah, that would be my message to everyone's younger self. Um, and my message to you all now is regardless of how much you think it's on your shoulders, there's always someone in the same boat and you asking for help might be the step they need to ask for help. So. Fabulous. Thank you, David. Very excited to have you on board too. And we're going to hear from you again in a moment, aren't we? So thank you. And then we've got um, the um, but last but definitely not least new member of our team. So the final new member of our team that you're going to meet tonight. You, If you've attended our webinars, you've met before in webinar number 10. Ngozi came and uh, presented to us a boat ride of reflection, which so many people have spoken to me about since. Um, and so um, Ngozi, are you going to introduce yourself to us? Hello everyone, my name is Ngozi Angocha. That's the way my name is said. And Ngozi means blessing. So I use that as my middle name, but I like to be called Ngozi. I'm a second year, final year MA student, social work student at Teesside University. And social work. I love social work because it's taught me a lot under a very short time that I've been in it. Because um, I say to myself that I'm a crossover uh, teacher to social work. And not just teacher, but I spent... 20 years of my life in theology, where I had my first degree and my first master's 
degree, but it's not a waste. So if you're here tonight and you think that you're wasting your time in social work, no, because whatever you've done before, you will have transferable skill from that to where you are now and where you are going. So bringing back to the future to it, my, my past experiences and learning experiences, it's given me a lot that I have here uh, taking with me. Though it may seem very difficult at the beginning, which is why this quote by Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it is done. When I first thought of going into social work, it was a last minute decision because I got tired of the frustrations from teaching. You take time to prepare lessons and you get to school, secondary school students, and they just sometimes want to make you, you know, feel like, why am I here? But, and that's really <clears throat> breaking a lot of teachers. But I'm not saying that teaching is not a good profession, but then I decided to come into social work so as to be more involved because as a teacher then, I was doing more of social work work and I actually got told off by my HOD <laughs> that it's not your job. Leave that for the safeguarding person or it's not for you, you know, and that is why I decided to come into social work. And the lockdown, it's not a big deal because we're in it. We spent one year, we don't know when it's going to end, but we have to embrace the new normal or whatever we have now. If you have placement or you don't have it, just make do with what you have. It may seem impossible, but when the next day comes, what today is will not be a past. It can be the same, but the future will be better because there are better things ahead. We're not seeing face to face, but we have virtual means to meet, to do even much more. So we take advantage of what we have because we're still here and we will get to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ngozi. Um, I love the way you complete, you took us through into the future then <laughs> seamlessly. Brilliantly. Thank you for that so much. We're so excited to have all of these new members of the team join us. And we've extended the team so that we know everybody's under loads of pressure. There's placements, the number of essays these guys have been talking about this week that they're writing. Kat and Chris are now qualified, the ASYE stuff that's going on. So that we've got a team that can support one another and that can make sure that we're here every week for the webinars. And we've got a fabulous few, um, well, we've got months worth of webinars coming up actually on loads of different topics. And uh, we're going to tell you shortly how you can register for lots of them ahead rather than having to wait. We're going to uh, talk about we've got lots of them already loaded up and ready to fire. So they'll be coming to you soon. But just as we think about concluding our topic for tonight, the theme song of the film, we will be ending our session tonight with the music of the theme song. But the theme song, The Power of Love, was by Huey Lewis and the News. And it was a huge success globally. It got an Ad uh, Academy Award nomination. But as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, if you watch the news at the moment, there's not much love being demonstrated. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of concern. There's a lot of oppression. There's so much inequality. There's so much social injustice. We need to connect together as a profession and we need to look to the future with love and with hope. And that's what all of us need to take forward. As a practice educator, I am incredibly proud to work with this group of fabulous students and newly qualified workers who are the future of our profession. And I know Marie shares that um, as well as a practice educator, how um, it's brilliant to work with students to see the future 
of the profession. So you're all going to meet this team again many times. They're coming up with some fabulous ideas for the webinars in the future. But I'm going to um, hand over for the final aspect of our webinar content today. I want you to sit back and I want you to listen to this uh, wonderful poem by our um, webinar team member, David, who is now a self-published poet. And I read his poems and I said, please, will you read this one to us? The importance of love for us as a profession cannot be uh, thought about more than listening to one of David's poems and looking at his artwork as he reads it to you. So sit back and listen to this wonderful poem. This poem is called Nature Heals. <clears throat> Bring me your sick and worried soul, your everlasting torment and your bedtime woes. Gift them to me through your spiritual retreat and I'll help you to scrub your soul and give it back shiny and clean. Enter this home and meet the Fae, the magic of old and seclusive appeal, the magic inspired the stories of brave and tales of woe. I welcome your troubles, your visceral scars. I will merge your soul with the essence of the woods and no more shall your heart be sore. I take it. Well, thank you David it's lovely uh, the messages in your poetry and your artwork is lovely and we're so pleased that you've brought that into our webinars thank you for sharing that with us thank you for letting me share and so in terms of our this image was done by Kelly brilliantly talented image here from Kelly Back to the Student Connect webinars, part two, because there's a trilogy, I think, of the films. I did only watch the one. If I'm honest, I did only watch the one over Christmas, but I believe there's three parts. Anyway, we're going into part two of the Student Connect webinars. So over the next few weeks, we have fabulous webinars. Next week, we've got a panel webinar. You know, we have different types of webinars. Next week, it's a panel of webinar of guests. And we're gonna be looking at men in social work, a really interesting topic for practice educators and students and all social workers. And I think the team are gonna be putting the um, link to join that webinar into the chat now. The week after that, we're going to be looking at the importance of adult learning theory and how that can support you as a student, how newly qualified workers can use that to support them through their ASYE. We're going to talk about how you can use it in your social work practice and practice educators using it. So that will be important for everybody. Then we're going to be looking at LGBTQ plus history month. And we have, again, another panel webinar 